This week's podcast is sponsored by the Embroiderers Guild of America at egausa.org. Each month, EGA offers an expansive roster of creative and educational opportunities for needleworkers around the globe. One of the extended benefits of the Boston Stitch Party Annual Seminar is the 2023 International Teacher Tour. This year, Allison Cole, one of the best designers and authors in the needlework world, will hold classes in San Francisco, Knoxville, Tennessee, Palos Verdes and Ontario, California, Fort Myers and Melbourne, Florida, Tucson, Arizona, Buffalo, New York, and Ellicott City, Maryland. To learn specific dates, what designs she'll be teaching, and how to sign up for a class, visit the events section of the EGA website. The International Teachers Tour is just one of many learning events and stitching opportunities you can experience as a member of EGA. Learn more about what the EGA has to offer and how to join at egausa.org. Thanks to EGA for sponsoring this week's show. Now on to our conversation with Jen Weber of the Clever Bunny Studio. This week we have a bonus show. Jen Weber will also be with us live in the Fiber Talk Stitch Hour Wednesday, June 14 at 8 p.m. Eastern on the Fiber Talk YouTube channel. Mark your calendars and join us to learn more about Jen's Tamari designs and to get your questions answered. And now our conversation with Jen Weber. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week from the Clever Bunny Studio, Jen Weber. Jen, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah. All right. We got to know about the bunny part first. So let's, okay. let's just get the, get the bunny part out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I love bunnies. I'm a little obsessed with bunnies. Um, I've had pet rabbits for. 20 years or so they're just wonderful happy creatures and I relate to that so um yeah they're everywhere they're tattooed on me they're in my art they're in my house so (laughs) easy way to remember me (laughs) yeah so how many do you have at this moment I only have one I do a lot of work with rescues rabbit rescues and and outreach about how to take care of house rabbits because honestly they're hard animals to work that they're not as easy as people think um so i only have one he's a senior he's 11 right now he's living a good life yeah. but what what yeah. is the lifespan for a rabbit that lives in a, in a house oh it's about eight to 12 years plus oh, so or minus. You, you really okay you got one that's, oh it's yeah. a commitment and i have a senior yeah so he's starting to have a little bit of issues but they can live 15 16 they can really live long lives oh. um so most people think they're just like, you know, cute little pets. You put them in a cage and no, 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 no. They, they run around the house. They're litter trainable. They have incredible personalities. They interact with other pets. They, they're very social. They are, I think, underappreciated. So yeah, that was my next question. Does it run around the house like a cat? So it's just absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they run and I have to, they're chewy. They experience the world by tasting. So you have to bunny proof. You have to watch your wires you know, and maybe not let them in all the rooms that you have something you, you can't bunny proof very well. So, um, yeah, but they, they come running down the stairs when you shake the treat bag, they are just really, Oh, the whole oh, yeah. thing. oh man. Oh, absolutely. They're very smart. My current bunny likes to tease my cat and he will hop around her in circles until she tries to like swat at him and then she gets yelled at for swatting at him. And then he actually dances. You can see that it's called a binky. They hop up and down like, ha ha, I got you in trouble. Like a toddler. It's so funny. They're wonderful. Wow. I didn't know all that. Wouldn't it? I thought people just who had them just had them in cages. and. Uh-uh. Wow. They're no, no, they are. They are house pets by far. And some people keep them in cages and it's a real shame. They really need room to run and stretch and exercise. Um, but they are. So, so I spend a lot of time with rescues and also trying to work on educating people about the commitment that they are. They're not easy pets. So yeah, um, well, every year at Easter, you know, there's always the the public uh, service announcements about don't buy, don't, don't buy them as a pet because yeah, they're, yeah. It's uh, a bit, yeah. It's terrible. Only 1% of Easter rabbits that are, are given as 
bunnies, baby bunnies, live to be one years old because people just dump them outside. Oh, and they're not, on. they do. And their domestic rabbits are not the same as outdoor wild rabbits. They cannot survive outdoors. They don't know how to forage. They can't eat just grass. And they get picked up by predators. It's really a sad, sad thing. So mm. that's, I'm always a big part of that. Like, yes, put it out there, get the message out. Please don't encourage breeding for Easter. And it, you know, understand if you're getting one, it's a 10 year commitment. So, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. So, bunnies. I love, love, yeah, love, that's, love. Bunnies. That's pretty cool. I did not know that. I, I, I had to ask you because. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, great. I'm glad to talk about it. And I came to bunnies through fiber arts. Really? Um, Yeah, I grew up with a lot of different pets, but never rabbits. And when I learned to spin in my early 20s, I thought, oh, I can get an Angora bunny because you can spin their fur into yarn. And I ended up getting a rescue Angora. And as soon as I did the research about, you know, having a bunny, I realized, oh, this is a house pet. This is not, I don't want to put this bunny in a cage and collect its fur, you know, and that just sent me down that literal rabbit hole. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so did you ever spin uh, Angora? I did briefly. Um, in general, I don't spin very much Angora. It's very, just because I don't, I don't collect it. And I also, I'm straddling a, a strange world because I'm a fiber artist and I spin and there's a lot of people who raise Angora bunnies for their fur. And I, a lot of times they're not house pets, so I don't like to buy fur wow. to encourage that kind of breeding. I understand those people. I have friends who've done it, so it's – I'm a little torn because I'm also a rabbit advocate, and I'm right. like, oh. I mean, I, there are people who raise bunnies for meat, and you know that also kind of – I'm like, oh. It's not my choice. I try to understand other people's choices and be respectful, but it's a little, yeah, felt tough. Well, is it is it uh, Angora like shave them like you do sheep and collect it that way? Is that how they do it? You you actually pluck it. It when they shed naturally, you just pluck it out of them, and it doesn't hurt them. Um, You don't cut it. it. You just kind of when they're what we call blowing their coat and domestic rabbits do it it's hair everywhere and they look (laughs) ridiculous with like tufts coming out but you just gently pluck it out of them and and they can they can shed four times a year and it's it's the softest fiber ever it's it's wonderful and delightful and you know so so i can understand um the appeal the texture is just luscious but yeah 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 it really is that's interesting so so then you can raise them and collect the fur when they when they shed, huh? That's interesting. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you can do it very humanely, which right. is which is nice. But yeah, I still, you know, breeding and some of the Angora breeds, there's a number of different breeds, can be inbred if you're not careful about, you know, your your gene pool stock and things. So in general, I do as little as I can to impact or encourage breeding of rabbits because there are too many already. So, you know, I'm in that side of the yeah. side of the thing. That's all right. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm neutral. I, it doesn't matter to me either way. Uh, just as long as that's they aren't, fair. As long as they aren't abused. That's all I care about. Yep. Yep. Or eating your garden probably. Yeah. That, yeah, there is that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So weaving, spinning, dying, and then Tamari. Where, yes. Where, where do we start with all this? Because that's, that's the full range right there. Right. Um, so I always did crafts as a child. I had loved to have my fingers busy. Um, and I did. Okay, I got to stop you right there. I, did... I got, I got you know, oh. part of part of an ongoing survey. OK, you like to keep your fingers busy, do, do crafts. Is that because you come from a family of creative people? Or just a you? little. Um, I do. Th- my yes, my mother's side of the family, they all did crochet and. They all made those zigzag crochet afghans oh, yeah. that you've seen like yep. in the 70s, 80s. I mean, everybody had like five of those. Everybody knew how to do that, but nobody knew how to like read a pattern or be creative. They just knew how to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> it was really kind of funny. And um, and a little bit of cross stitch in there as well. Um, but it was very much – it. I would say it was like a, my family was more about getting kits and following kits for the creative – 
um, outlet, but not necessarily being creative themselves, developing their own patterns yeah. or doing freehand style things. So I, I did have that influence. I mean, when, as a child, I wanted to try everything. So I was doing beading. Um, I didn't knit. Somehow we were in the crochet camp, not the knitting camp. But um, And I did dabble in cross stitch and needlepoint as a kid. But I didn't get into what I call, you know, the fiber arts of like spinning and weaving until I was in my early 20s. And I read a, I was reading a historical novel where they were talking about a spinning wheel. And I just was like, okay, how does a spinning wheel work? And my background is in, in math and chemistry. So uh -oh. I was trained as, yeah, so I was trained okay, as I a scientist. I can see this coming together in a hurry, yeah. And, yeah. So I'm like, I need to know how this works. How does this work? I love to figure out how things work. And I found, because I, when I see pictures of the spinning wheel and you see that big wheel and there's always a thread going around that big wheel. And I thought that was the yarn you were making. And so I took a class at a little local yarn shop to learn how to spin and, oh, oh, that's, that's not the yarn you're making. That's just the drive band that's giving you, you know, mechanical advantage. Oh, now it makes sense. And I, I actually really enjoyed the spinning. And I was going through a pretty stressful time in my life. And it turns out for me, spinning was very meditative. And it was a, a way to do something and not be a perfectionist, which is unusual for me. Many of us, I think, it's like you want your crafts to be so perfect. Right. But when you're spinning, it's like, whoop, well, it's just you put twist into fiber and off you go to the next bit of fiber. Like once the twist is in there, there's not a lot you can do to get it out. So you have to go with the flow. And I really I enjoyed that for a couple of years, but I was generating yarn and not doing anything with it. It wasn't enough to crochet an Afghan and and I had really gotten into like patterns and reading patterns and things. But I was like, all right, what do I do with this? And and some people recommended, well, why don't you learn to weave? So I, I went, uh, okay, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're you talking know. about some equipment now, yeah. <laughs> oh, right, because I already had gotten a spinning wheel. Now, I, I had married a very wonderful man who he supports all of my fiber habits. So he, he you know, he's like, all right, well, what are we doing now? You know, and I'm like, sorry, honey, it's another thing. And I learned to weave. And that was it. I was just like, oh, my God, there's pattern. There's mass. Oh, I'm in this. Like, <laughs> so happy. And some people, when they weave, they get into the texture of the cloth you create, or they're really enticed by the colors. And I do love color, but pattern was everything for me. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is fantastic. So I dove right into the crazy really heavy patterning theories and designing. And I loved that. And so, that, so do we, we have to move things out of the way to make room for a, a, a loom and. Uh, oh yeah. No, I mean, okay. okay. My first loom, when I was ready to buy a loom, which was really the first time I learned how to weave people <laughs> buy really small little looms. And I'm like, what's the biggest thing I can find? Like what gives me the most flexibility for pattern? Oh, and it's, it's like four feet by four feet like it takes up a whole room in the house um, and and people come in and it's the first thing you see when you enter my house so if anyone comes in they see this gigantic wooden loom it's a Swedish loom so it's all wooden string and they're like what is that and I'm like yeah that's my first loom I ever got it's it's amazing <laughs> I've had a few other migrate to my home but um, that's my that's my baby but it's not big enough Great you know, conversation piece right out of the gate. It is. Every time if we have to have like an electrician over, they walk into the house. First they see the loom and then they see all the tamari everywhere. And they're like, what? What is this place? <laughs> and I'm like, it's heaven. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just leave me welcome alone. To my, <laughs> yes, welcome to my den of fiber. It's um. So I, did, I, I, I really got into weaving and it was at that point that I discovered weaving guilds. I didn't. I didn't know people got together and talked about fiber like, mm. wow, you know, so, so I discovered weaving guilds and that was a lot of fun. And soon enough, I was teaching people just out of my home to weave or spin or to dye. I loved, I, I really quickly gravitated towards dyeing because it's just like being back in the lab. Like, okay. So, me. so back up a little bit. So, all right. I mean, you, you have all yeah. the, all the fundamentals of, of fiber art right from scratch. Did, 
is the, is the whole process what you enjoy or are there parts that you do because you have to to get to the weaving or the needlework or whatever? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I am lucky enough that I do whatever I enjoy. I, I die because when I dye yarns, I don't die because I have to. I die because I want to. Sometimes I have a specific project that I want very specific colors for. So like my designing does influence like my preparation of things, definitely. But I don't spin very much anymore. So I don't really spin to create my fibers. Um, I do use commercial fibers. I spin just to relax. Mm -hmm. and honestly not very much and I'll tell you the truth my looms do not see a lot of work anymore they are kind of lonely because <laughs> once I found Tamari I was like whatever <laughs> everything else is just you know relegated to the corner now <laughs> yeah yeah so it's um but I, I do it because I love it and I I, I love that I, I appreciate particularly with, let's say, dying, that I understand how it works. And so I feel this exhilaration of control mm -hmm. over it. Um, and, and I'm not afraid of it. Like, I think a lot of fiber artists are very nervous around dying because they, they hear, oh, chemicals, oh, very dangerous. And yeah, you, you have to respect the chemicals. But manufacturers give you a lot of really good information. They make the safety guidelines very clear. And so with just a little bit of forethought and care, you can very safely do so much, um, you know, and you don't have to rely on the colors that you see in the yarn store or the needlework store. So it can be a lot of fun playing with color that way. Yeah, do for you, sure, for sure. Do you still, I mean, the dyeing gives you a lot of options. Is that something that you still do? Or are you able to find commercial fibers that do the job for you so it's, it's you know, essentially not worth the trouble? It's it's worth the trouble if, again, if, if my design calls for something. Okay. So um, I, I designed a Tamari that I wanted to use silk and I wanted very specific colors, especially if I want a gradient of colors. If you really want a specific hue in a bunch of range of values or saturation, it is hard to get um, the fibers to come in like five shades of exactly that hue. Maybe uh -huh. you can get three, but five, if you really, really want that, in those cases, I will always die because then I have control. I know my hue is going to be the same and I can control how much color I put into each section of that yarn so that I get a gorgeous gradient. And it's not always you know, one shot, it's perfect. There's always going to be a little bit of testing that goes into it. But in those kind of cases, you know, especially for special projects, I do like to do my own dyeing. Um, but, but for average, you know, like a lot of work where I just, I need a good red or I need a nice blue. Like there are a lot of really great options out there for both weaving and embroidery threads that I use that I just use commercial. It's, it's easier, yeah. gets me to the stitching and I'm a happy girl. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah. These days, uh, there are more than enough options for just about everything. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, it's almost overwhelming. I think too. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. It can be. Yeah, yeah. The the, big, the bigger stores with all the lines. Yeah, you could spend hours in there just staring at threads. Oh. Yep. And 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 then online, you know, like a lot of stores don't carry the full selection. So then you can, you know, order color cards and look at the 200 colors you can order <laughs> online. And yep. then it's like, well, I'd like them all. And uh. yep. <laughs> so sometimes choice is, is hard. Yeah, no, I, I, one area, many areas of sympathy I have for local needlework stores, but one of them is keeping up with, you know, if you carry six lines of threads, keeping up with uh. all the colors and, oh. and knowing that uh, every day someone's going to come in wanting the color that you don't have. And oh. It's just got to be just maddening at some point that you can never get on top of it. And I think it's really one of the driving factors of why so many of these stores are disappearing. Mm. And it's really, it's really sad because the overhead cost of running a brick and mortar store plus having to stay on top of that inventory, it's, it's just almost too much. You know, and, and and sadly, I, I know some people who 
um, owned their own yarn store and closed eventually because they saw people coming into their store, looking and touching everything, looking at the colors. And then they'd say, oh, I can get this a dollar cheaper online. And they'd walk out, Yeah, which is heartbreaking because yeah. it's like, but, you know, you just had the ability to come and look at it in person and not on a computer screen. You should probably support that person yep. who's who's providing that opportunity for you. Yeah, so, one, one of my favorite, uh, not my fa- not favorite, favorite isn't the word, but a story that uh, sticks in my mind is I was in a local needlework store one Saturday and two women used up, uh, oh, a good chunk of the owner's time to select charts and you know talk mm-hmm. about threads and all this stuff. And they buy the charts and then as they're turning away from the cash register, one comments the other, well, now off to Joanne's to get the threads. <gasps> oh. How that owner didn't Scream. climb over the counter and just punch them, I don't know. But, yeah, it's uh, yeah, support those stores that just gave you an hour's worth of advice and help. Uh, I know. By buying the threads from them, for crying out loud. That's I've seen that too in a local a local needlework store where people come in and they have a maybe they even have a printed grid like a needle point grid that they're going to work on and they're trying to get help choosing the wools to match that you know from a different thread line than maybe supported that grid product product and they get all the advice and they write it all down and they leave they're like are, are you serious yeah like, like could you at least tip that person i mean that was Something. like an hour of time <laughs> yep. it's terrible yep yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Breaks it, the heart. Yeah, it, it's just uh, just stop and think for a moment what you just did, folks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I always try to shop. It's I don't have a to- a lot of places around me that I can buy what I use in person, which is tough. But I usually go there first, and you know, if I can't, if they don't have it or they're not going to be able to order it for me, then I will try to find something online. So, yeah. but it's yeah, I really believe in supporting because it's. We're going to miss them when they're gone. Yep. We really are. Oh, I, have a, sure. I have a terrible habit of going in those stores and feeling like I should buy something, even though I just went in to look. I was in a, a store the other day, and uh, I was just exploring what an option would be. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, you know, what, what could it be? Took a couple pictures, uh, just said, hey, I just want to look at this stuff, uh, you know, take a couple pictures. And... As I'm leaving, you should really buy something. Yeah. Just because they at least let you lay stuff out on their table and use their yardstick. And I should buy yeah. something. And I didn't because I'll, I'll be back and buy something from them uh, in the near future. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I have, a, I have a whole collection of stuff that I've picked up, one or two items, just because I felt like I should put money in the till just for the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's really considerate of you to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a hard – and I have a hard time walking out without something because I always find things I want. <laughs> I find these charts. I'm like, oh, I want to stitch this. I want to do this. Look at these colors. I have a sh- just a shameful amount of threads that are just so beautiful. I bought them, and they sit in my bins because I'm like, these are so pretty i don't know what to use them for and they sit there <laughs> so you yeah know, i have those too i have a whole bunch of that stash. Yeah, yeah. that stash building we do isn't it wonderful yeah. no i oh, went yeah. uh we interviewed uh, the ladies from appleton's wool here a few weeks mm. ago and mm. i hadn't handled appleton's wool in forever so i went oh. to the local shop and they carry it by the truckloads and nice. i bought 10 skeins now i have no idea what i'm going to do with those 10 skeins <laughs> <laughs> Probably nothing, but I just wanted some to experience it before I talked to them, so I'd feel like I was connected to them. And so yeah. now I have this nice fistful of uh, beautiful Appleton's wool that oh. uh, I'll figure out something. I don't know. Ah. Oh, yeah, it'll come to you. You'll use it eventually, and yeah. you know you have it as inspiration, <laughs> which is just great. Yep. But hey, okay. you know, they, they were kind enough to help me out, and I, all right, I gotta, I gotta help them too. So yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, we're partners. We're partners. Yep. All for right. Sure. So what happens? What happens in 2011 that puts Tamari at the forefront, and you haven't looked back? Yes. Yeah, so I moved to Maryland, um, and we live near Baltimore. And I, but not in Baltimore proper. So I joined um, a Harford County Weavers Guild. It's a small Weavers Guild, maybe at the time 25 people, and I didn't know anybody. 
you know, I was just like, hi, I leave. Can I make some friends? And <laughs> one of the first meetings was a field trip to the Philadelphia Weavers Guild, which is quite a large Weavers Guild. They were having an exhibition. They were having, I don't remember what year it was, but like their 40th or 50th anniversary of their guild. So they had this really nice um, gallery showing of all the things everybody had made during the year. So I carpool up with like 15 strangers to this, <laughs> this show. And I'm just kind of walking around and I'm like, there is just gorgeous, gorgeous towels and scarves and clothing and all oh, these wonderful wovens and off to the side there's a little wall with a couple of folding tables and mostly they're filled with these I still remember these beautiful hand felted vessels like vases and bowls oh they were gorgeous and there on the corner uh, just this little unassuming glass bowl full of these little balls uh -oh. that were incredible and I walked up to this and I stopped dead in my tracks and I'm like, what is this? And I had so, no so idea. So we've got a massive space of beautiful weaving and everything else. And yes. You find the and bowl of balls. The, okay. I find the bowl of balls and I stop and I'm like, this is amazing. And I, I immediately, my brain is going, how does this work? And I didn't understand that it was embroidery. I just saw pieces of thread all connecting like puzzles and overlapping. How, how does this work? And I, my brain is worrying a million miles a minute. And these guild mates of mine are walking by me as they're browsing the table. And each person walks by me and I'm like, look, look at this. Did you see this? Did you see this? And they're like, yeah, okay, bye. You know, calm they're not down. that excited. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I cannot calm down. And I think I thought almost every person had walked by me and in my brain, I'm going, what is wrong with these people that they don't see how cool this is? <laughs> and I was starting to feel really disappointed at, or also what's wrong with me that this is so yeah, cool. Yeah. And all of a sudden, a voice next to me goes, oh, my God, what's that? And I turn and there's this little woman and she's going, what is this? I said, I don't know. <laughs> and she goes, I have to do that. And I said, I do too. And she just ran off and grabbed somebody and said, what is this? And they said, that's Japanese tamari. And she came over and she goes, we have to do this. Hi, my name is Karen. And I'm like, hi, my name is Jen. And we kind of met that way. This and is how you guys met was over that yeah, bowl of balls. Holy smokes. Balls. And so she just said, look, um, you know, I live in this town, come over to my house, you know, I'm going to find out how to do this. Here's my email address. I'm like, okay, cool. So we immediately sit down and found, we found Barbara Cease's first book, which, um, is a great book. It's called Japanese Tamari, a colorful spin on an ancient craft. And, it is so there there's not a lot of books, let me tell you right now in English that talk about Tamari or teach Tamari. Um and we both ordered a copy of that book and it came and it thankfully it's a skill building book. It's pattern after pattern that sort of slowly introduces you to it. And I went over to her house once a week and we stitched our way from cover to cover. And we devoured the book. Like <laughs> and we made a lot of mistakes. And Oh, we just, we made some hilarious mistakes. We struggled with trying to find good metallic thread. We, we just all over the place, but we were obsessed with this and we would go to our guild meetings and we would be stitching Tamari, you know, and everyone is looking at us like you two are crazy. And we're like, yes, we are. <laughs> and then we, we found out that the author, Barbara Cease was teaching at John C. Campbell folk school in Brasstown, North Carolina. And, you know, that's, that's a trek for us. And we were like, well, what do you think? Let's let's ask our husbands how they feel about us just dropping everything and leaving for a week. And they were like, go for it. And off we flew down to, to North Carolina. And we studied with Barb for a week. And I think we scared her because... <laughs> You're scaring oh, me. Did... I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, we were nuts. Like, we were there in a class, mostly beginners, a couple of people who had done, but we'd been obsessed with this for like eight months. So we're in the corner finishing each other's sentences and whispering to each other like little trolls, what you, back and forth. And she's just like staring at us like, I don't know what to do for you. <laughs> but we picked her brain and we learned, you know, we're able to really get pretty advanced techniques um, from her. And 
that was it. I mean, it was everybody was just laughing at the two of us at how how strange we were. And it was around that time that we kind of came up with this idea of we're the Tamari twins because you have to understand, Gary, we are nothing alike. We don't look alike. We are, you know, kind of different generations. We don't sound alike. We definitely don't think alike. We don't mm-hmm. talk alike. But we were both so obsessed with Tamari. This is what bound us together as twins. Yeah, that was that was something I was going to mention was that uh, is really neat about this is, yeah, you're not even close to the same age. Yeah, uh-huh. and, and yet needle art brings you together and basically makes you, you twin. Well, you say you Tamari twins. Uh, We're the, yeah, yeah, it does. It, it brings you, it's one of the things I think all of, all of my experience in fiber art has always been my friends range all over the place, different age groups, different backgrounds, um, different political affiliations. I have friends who I do not agree on a lot of topics with, but it doesn't matter because it's the fiber that gets us together, you know, and, and I have a lot of, I cherish that connection because it has given me a broader understanding of people that maybe I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and I think Karen and I really, that was a, a pretty good example of that. And it wasn't long after that, that some of our friends were like, Hey, that looks neat. Can you show us how to do it? So we started teaching out of her house and then we decided our friends who had this yarn shop, we're going to teach a class. And we dove in and we were like, we're the Tamari twins. And we dove into teaching and it was crazy. But we ended up teaching up and down the whole East Coast, teaching at conferences, teaching at a lot of guilds, doing programs for fiber guilds. Um, and it was it was just so much fun. Um, and we complemented each other very well. But one of the things that I, I really loved about Um, working with Karen is because we really, she has no, let me say this. She has a really terrible spatial sense. And Tamari (laughs) has, is geometric. You look at a ball and you divide. This isn't going to (laughs) work. I know. And, and I have an extremely strong geometric and spatial sense, not just from my math background, but I'm just, that's how I think. So I look at a, a ball and I we divide it up into different shapes and you you put lines on a tamari it's called guidelines and that's what you build your pattern off of and I just look at him like look at these shapes this is and she's like I don't see any shapes what are you talking about shapes I see lines and I'm like what do you mean lines I see shapes so we already didn't speak the same language uh-huh. and we had to learn to talk to each other and we had to learn we ta- as we were teaching each other through the book and our processes I could see how her brain worked and, oh, okay, so you're, you're looking at it this way and I'm looking at it this way. And isn't this really interesting? Well, now, does that help uh, seeing, knowing that someone has a completely different perspective? Does that help you with design? Does that give you a different uh, dimension to look at with design? It it helps me um, not as much with design. I think when I'm designing, I'm really relying on how I see it. Okay. But it helps me tremendously when I'm teaching and uh-huh. especially when I'm writing patterns and instructions because I am extremely aware of I look at this one way, but there are so many different ways that people learn and I want to be able to reach them all. And um and I, for when we were for teaching together, I would sometimes really rely on Karen. I am, I will give you all the details. I'll go into the how and the why. And there would sometimes be students that just looked at me and said, I don't really care why. I don't understand it. Just show me what I need to do. And I'm like, well, let me explain it. You know, and I just want to get science-y and explain-y. And Karen would walk over and go, oh, stop. And she'd elbow me out of the way. She'd say three <laughs> words. And this person would understand it. And I'm like, how? how did you do that? She's like, Oh, Jen, you talk too much, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> yes, I know that, but still. So, <laughs> you know, she could connect with people who kind of thought in her way and it was really, um, but what it really drove home to me was if someone like Karen who had no spatial sense at all could stitch Tamari, anybody can, Yeah, anybody can, you know, like it's just a matter of, coming at it the way your brain thinks about it. And if you're determined enough, of course you can do it. You know, it might not come easy, but that doesn't mean 
you can't. Right. So that was a, a really big take home message for me. Um, and it was, we, yeah, we had a lot of fun. We, um, she did not enjoy teaching as much as I did. Um, I've always loved teaching. It's, it's been a passion of mine for as long as I can remember. No, and, we should, we should be clear. Uh, Karen retired from, uh, teaching and yes, you yes. still work with um, her some. Yeah, we're still friends. And she's kind of she's kind of gone back a little bit more to like some of more uh, weaving and needlepoint and some of her other fiber arts. Oh, um, okay. She's kind of like done a lot of she's and she stitched a lot more than I did. I would stitch. We would stitch a design together and then she would stitch it two or three more times to work on her muscle memory and mm. practice. Mm. And so she kind of I think she burned out a little faster than I did. And we we knew early, too, that like like this was it for me for the long haul, you know, I was like, Oh yeah. And I love teaching so much and she loved doing it. And, um, our time stitching together, we just got into these Tamari patterns that as you get more and more complicated, the balls get bigger and the pattern gets more intricate and they take a lot longer to do. And we weren't completing as many together anymore. And so that also, I think took some of the fun away. Mm. Um, and also, um, I had a, I had a take a, sort of a break for a couple of years because my father had a stroke in 2017 and I pretty much put down all of my fiber work for taking care of him. And yeah. that, that separation also really didn't help. So not being able to stitch together, um, you know, she kind of was like, okay, I guess I got to move on. And so that was about the time she retired, but she was always very encouraging. She's like, you need to keep doing this, yeah. you know? And I was so, like, I'm going to. So, so basically life, life happened. Yeah. 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 It does. It does. And, um, and yeah, so she, it's, so she's, she's still definitely, you know, an amazing part of my life. And I love, I love that I still get recognized as a Tamari twin. People say, Oh, you're one of the twins. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, so I'm, I'm having a hard time rebranding myself as the clever bunny girl, but I'm like, you know, I'm, I can't be a twin without my other twins. Right. So. Well, it sounds like a good legacy to have behind you or with you or however you approach it. Yeah. It, yeah, it was. And I, and I, like I said, I learned a lot. And when I teach now, it's like I have both. Um, one thing was we used to struggle to write instructions together. It was difficult because I wanted to make a 500 page booklet and she wanted a paragraph. <laughs> so it's like, okay, like, Everything about us was different. And so now I have the, the freedom to make the directions the way I want to write them. But I've learned a lot about, well, why does she want them so short? You know, how can I how can I make it useful for people who get overwhelmed by that much information? So how do I talk to people who don't have a good spatial sense? So I, I really have learned a lot from from working with her. And I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, it gives you that powerful second dimension when it comes to working with uh, with students. Yes, it does. And I still str there are times where sometimes I I, I struggle. Um, there are some students who speak my language, and there are some who don't. And I have a longtime student who uh, she doesn't speak my language, and we struggle like. And we both work at it and I explain it and she says what she's thinking and I say, no, this is what I'm thinking. And we just work back and forth. And, and over the years, we've actually kind of finally found a way to communicate a little more quickly. And we always get there. We always get there, but it's a little more work. And there are students where I just kind of raise one eyebrow and they understand me, you know, it's like <laughs> telepathy. So yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's fun. And I will say it's extremely satisfying when I, when I'm, you know, it's not as natural of a explanation or communication. And when I see that light bulb go off and they get it, I just, it's like, oh, that's the best drug in the universe, you know, like, oh my God, they got it. Look at them go. It's yeah. just such joy. So, yeah. Oh, as, uh, as a former teacher, um, yeah, that's, that's why people teach right there is when the, oh. when the light goes on and oh. uh, you've helped them. Isn't get that, there. Yep. isn't that, that's, that's why I tell people like, I, I, sometimes think I, I do love teaching almost more than I love stitching. It's yeah. just that, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love, I love being creative and I love stitching and I, I love it. I love it, but it's a little lonely, you know, like it's, <laughs> but it's that interpersonal connection that, and, and taking something you love and watching someone else get excited about it and do it. And it's, that's, that's just 
amazing. It's yep. amazing. That, those are the moments. Those are the moments. Absolutely. Yeah. No Absolutely. So then, so we have this period of life being in the way or altering life, <laughs> altering things. Uh, was there a conscious decision to uh, start the Clever Bunny studio or did that just kind of evolve as you got back to it? That did evolve as I got back to it. I knew that, um, yeah, it was about a, a couple year hiatus and it was, um, and it was not a hiatus by choice. It wasn't like, oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. It was like, I, I needed to take care of my father and it was a very dark time for me. I didn't feel any creativity at all. And I was actually really kind of depressed, well, not really was depressed that I would never be able to be creative again. And like, I actually it was actually through Tamari, a specific ball that I stitched, which I have a blog post about, which I, I had a wonderful experience. I, I had already signed up to do a talk at a guild that I was a member of. And so I knew some of the people there and, you know, they knew what was going on with my father. And I, I went, I did my Tamari talk and, you know, I put on the happy face and then we went out to lunch and they were like, how are you really doing? I'm like, I'm terrible. I am never going to be creative again. You know, I, I just, it's just not good. And this was pre pandemic. So like, you know, I think we have a better understanding now yeah, <laughs> as yeah. a society, but I was trying to explain this to them and they were like, and one of them, um, you know, she said, look, I just watched this program about, you know, art and creativity. And she said, they really expect, explain something that creativity is like the breath and that you can't always be creative. Sometimes you really need to take a while to inhale some inspiration mm. and let your juices just churn so that you can then later exhale and be creative. And that concept for me blew my mind and it got me really back on track. And I was driving home through the countryside farmlands of, of Pennsylvania and Maryland. And I was, just thinking. And in my head, I, I was like, I have to stitch a Tamari that shows that I have to stitch Tamari showing creation from inspiration. And I had this idea in my head and I got home and I started sketching and I worked on that ball for four months. And, and when I ended, I, and it's, it's this rainbow swirl ball and it's, it's stitched in a way that the colors look very like the design looks like, Oh, that, that makes sense. But it's actually a difficult way to stitch, to change colors the way that ball does. But, um, and I always show people the front of it is big, beautiful rainbow swirl ball. It's actually white on the back and the sides, the colors blend into pastels and then they blend into white oh. and it's, and it hangs and it turns and it's a yin and a yang. So you see the color, the white side is my inhalation when you're just trying to gather it up. And then it bleeds into creation with the colors. Uh. And so I named it Inhalation Exhalation. And I will tell you, that was the first time I ever felt like an artist. Um, because I had this idea and I wanted to create it. It wasn't just a pattern. It wasn't colors. I, I had this concept that I wanted to express. And, and I know people are not going to look at my ball and think, oh, she's obviously had trouble with her father. You know, like, I mean, <laughs> right. It's, it's, they're not going to get the literal story, but it, to me, it tells enough of that story, that motion. Right. And, and so that ball, the journey of that ball, um, and that's the ball that I, I put in a Japanese, um, an exhibition in Japan in 2019. That was really me coming out of that darkness and, I, it was in a couple shows and I went to Japan It actually won an award. And it was that kick in the butt. I think that was like, Oh, you know what? You can do this. You, you, you have a point of view and you should break out of just being the Tamari twin that doesn't have, you know, a twin anymore. Mm -hmm. You have your own identity and, you know, embrace it. And, and that's when I kind of was like, yeah, okay, okay. I'm going to do this. And I sort of launched, started trying to launch. I'm, I'm not good at social media and I'm not good at updating my website. I mean, some of the photos on there are very, very old and my new ones are not up there. And I keep telling myself I've got to do that. But, um, but I did, I did finally like kind of kick myself and be like, all right, let's do this. So started trying to become the bunny girl instead of the twin. Well, did, that, the twin. did that design and successfully expressing what you were feeling through, through that ball, 
Did that kind of open a, a, a creative door that you had not experienced before? It really did. And I will say that it also gave me confidence. Ah, it really gave me maybe confidence. That's, maybe that's really what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, I mean, I, I've always been the kind of, and I think a lot of fiber artists are this way, right? Like a lot of us were like, oh, here's what I, here's what I made. Let me show you where I messed up. Right. We always like downplay our creations. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it too is we think of art as fine art, painting and sculpting, but whoa, we're just, we're just stitching. It's not, oh, that's not really art. It's well, this made me finally go, you know what? It is art. It is art. Yep. It is creation. It's expression. It's beauty. Um, you know, so, and it, if nothing else, it's bringing us joy to do it and to see it. So like, why do we put ourselves down? Why do we say like, oh, this doesn't count. Um, and that's really what, also pushed me because I had been um, working on my different levels of certification with the Japanese Tamari Association. They um, they're they're really the yeah, source what's, of what's of, that like? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's yeah. Be so a... they are. It's it's an interesting relationship. So Tamari is not well known outside of Japan. It's getting better now, and I'm very happy about that. But it's you know it's most people go, what the heck is that? But it's not because they don't want it to be well known. It's just the language barrier. Mm. Um, there, a lot of the books that are published are published by the Japanese Tamari Association. They formed in the 1980s um, to promote the craft and to keep it alive. And they publish most of the books that are that are Japanese. They publish, and you know they have a sensei. It's a big group, um, and they have these certification levels and these levels are meant to help people progress their skills. So um, there's like a beginner level and an intermediate level. And then level three is like, are you qualified enough to be a teacher? And then level four, okay, now we consider you a master of the, of the craft. And as an outsider trying to do that, when they literally only have like one person who speaks English, is pretty hard, <laughs> yeah. like literally. So it's, it's, and there's a lot of cultural differences too. And we try very hard to be respectful of that and, you know, don't just want to be pesky Americans, you know, help me all the time, help me all the time. Like, and the way that you study in Japan is you go over to your teacher's house once a week and they look at your work and they tell you what to work on next. And you, you know, and this relationship continues. It's like an apprenticeship. And at some point they look at your work and they say, okay, now you've passed. Now you're at this level. Oh, there's not some grand final exam or anything? You just... No, not not in the same... Well, th there is an exam, but not in the same way that we experience it as international students. Uh -huh. And as an international student for a long time, it was like, well, here's some rough guidelines. Stitch these kind of balls. Take some pictures. Do a little write-up. Send it over there. Yay, you pass. You know, But once enough people started doing it, the international branch was like, Ooh, we need to you know, how do we, how we can't just tell people do what we do. So how are we going to guide, guide international students? And so they developed a curriculum and I was really excited about obtaining my level three, which is a Shihan level, the teacher level, because I, when you become a certified teacher, you have explicit permission to use any of their published work for profit, oh. which is really important because copy you know we're really respectful of pattern and copyright and a lot of balls it's a lot of beginner balls and if you're teaching you're teaching beginner balls it's like well did you really design that there's there's a lot that it's just kind of like yeah you can it's it's hard to be inventive with very simple balls mm -hmm. and so you know to be respectful to the japanese if you obtain this certification it's like you're getting their permission right yeah. and it's 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 really nice. And so plus they have a great amount of resources for patterns that then, you know, you know, you can say, oh, OK, that's because otherwise you have to come up with your own patterns to teach only your own patterns oh. or have have permission from another creator to use their patterns. And it's very difficult. So that's another thing that kind of holds Tamari back from being very widespread. It's just this. There's not a lot of patterns out there that people have free permission to use. Mm -hmm. So so I was I had done my level one and my level two and they were making us wait a certain number of years in between levels 
because they figured you need to be stitching a whole bunch of balls, get some practice in before you're ready for the next level. And it was right around the time that I was working on this level three that they decided to implement a curriculum. And I will tell you, it is so daunting. It was, <laughs> it, it was like, what? I mean, they put together, it's for the level three, it's 83 patterns Whoa. that stitch. And some of these take a long time. And it's, they're demonstrating, you know, pretty high level skills, but here are these 83 balls, stitch these 83 balls. Some of them are optional, but you know, they're kind of mostly encouraged. Some of them are required and take photos of them, you know, put together your portfolio and you're, you have to be mentored by someone who's a level four. Hmm. So Barb sees, you know, the book author that I've gotten to know has, has been a mentor for me through my, my growing, um, and, and also a very good friend. So she's, she was helping me with that. And, but I was so stuck on this curriculum. I'm like, Oh my gosh. And that's the first part. The second part is you need to make eight original designs. You need to write them up directions, one diagram and directions on one page. Cause Holy they don't smoke. translate. Well. Yeah. And that's really not easy. No. <laughs> one page, one diagram to describe a three dimensional object. Okay. And then once that's approved, you send them to Japan to get examined. And so that's the process. So I liken this to getting a master's degree, maybe kind of more. It was, I worked on this for years and years and I had started before my father got sick, but coming back to it and having this swirl ball work really well. And I'm like, okay, I need to do this. I really need to get through this. This is, I, I, it'll open doors for me teaching. It'll open doors for me, you know, publishing patterns. I have to do this, but it took, it took years for me to struggle with the curriculum because I just didn't. Some of these balls took 60 hours just for one pattern. Uh -huh. And, mm. and it was like, I, you know, ah, I don't want to go through all these hoops. Just let me get to the end. So, um, but I did, I did finally get through the curriculum a couple years ago and then worked really hard in 2021, 2022, uh, for my original works and then passed and man, I passed last summer and I just didn't want to see a Tamari for like six months. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. But okay, so you so you passed level three, and so you're a certified teacher. Are you working on level four, or have you completed that too? I will work on level four. I okay. there is not like a yeah, there's not like a grand um, reward in a sense for level four. Uh, as a level three, now I have the ability to help level ones and twos pass. Uh -huh. And the big motivation for me to pass level four will be to help other people pass level three, because I really am interested in spreading the knowledge of this craft. Like that is a huge motivation for me. I love it and people don't know about it and I want everybody to know about it. Um, and we just need more people to be able to teach for sure. And so, um, but it's, it's going to be the same thing. It's an enormous, enormous curriculum to get through. So I'm going to give myself plenty of time to do that. I'm not in a rush. Yeah. What is that? 183 oh. balls or just <laughs> right? It's 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 not as many, but they're so intricate. Yeah, they're so intricate. You know, it's like oh, so so yeah. But um, but so I'm excited that I I've passed it, and now like it's really opened up. There's a lot of a lot of balls that I have stitched. I've stitched out of the Japanese books or inspired by, and I can show them to people, but I couldn't teach them the pattern. Right. Right. Because like, well, but now I can, now I can write my instructions. I can, here you go. I can teach you this one, you know? And so I, I have a lot of freedom now and it's very, I'm very happy. And I've already this past year working with students been excited to be like, Oh, look through this stack of books and tell me what you want to do. Any of these I can show you. Yeah. So it's, now, in, doing yeah, the it's just, in doing the research for you, I couldn't decide if if a clever bunny studio is a teaching studio or a design studio or yes, it is. Me. It, well, clever bunny studio is me yeah, <laughs> like, well. and it is both. It is both. Um, it is, I guess it's, yeah, I really think it's kind of a pairing of both um, designing. And my goal is, well, yeah, no, I, I guess teaching has to come first. I think my goal is to spread Tamari. I was going to say, there and seems to, to be an evangelism here that overrides everything. There is. 
There is, there is. No, I absolutely, I will convert everyone, <laughs> which, you know, I, it's not for everyone, but I've done over my years, I've, I've done a lot of outreach events, you know, photos just don't do this craft justice. And I would go to an outreach event or a fiber arts day somewhere. And I just spread about a hundred balls across a big table and people just walk up and they're blown away just like I was. And you can pick them up and you can turn them around in your hand and you're like, there's no edges. And I'm like, yes, that's the cool part. Yeah. Look at this. And so people are intimidated by it. Um, everybody says, oh, I can never do this so hard. This is so hard. And that's not true. I've, I've taught hundreds of people and they can all do it. So like, I'm like, you just don't know how yet. Trust right. me, you can do this. Yeah. Um, I think it's easier than weaving, but it's, um, so I, I want to get the information out there. I want to support people learning it, but really I want to support the intermediate people because there's enough beginner information out there now that if you're determined, like I was, you can find a book or you can, you know, find a couple YouTube videos and you can get the basics down. But what do you do after that? And that's where the gap is. There is not a lot of pattern for people who are intermediates. Oh, and okay. the, the problem is if you buy Japanese books, it is literally one diagram and a whole lot of kanji. And it's <laughs> very hard. Um, I don't know why, but my brain looks at those pictures and it makes sense to me. So I can look at a Japanese book or even sometimes a photo and I can tell how to do it. And I know that I'm very lucky that I have that ability. A lot of people can't. And so there's a translation that needs to happen. And when I write my, when I write my instructions, I write like, I do my own illustrations and I will have 20, 30 illustrations for one pattern. It's, I, I have come to understand people like step by step by step, which is fine. I mean, that's, that makes sense. Yep. And it's very hard to, to teach a three dimensional thing on two dimensional piece of paper. So, mm -hmm. so I, you know, it does take me a long time to do them, but like I have seen those write-ups people really like them. They, they're like, Oh my gosh, I want more. I want more. And the problem is they go, okay, where else can I get patterns? And they go out into the Tamari world and they're like, there are none. <laughs> There's mm. very few people writing patterns and doing directions because it's just so challenging and it takes a long time, you know, and it's, it's not, I, I don't want to put down other crafts, but it's not kind of the same as like writing up a knitting pattern where, you know, you have well understood tools and you don't you know, it's a two dimensional thing. So it's pretty quick to do a two dimensional graph. So it's, it, there's a, just, there's a lot to it. And that for me is kind of my goal yeah. is because I see people, I've seen people, they stitch the beginner stuff. They get stuck because they can't find what to do next and how to grow their skills and they quit. So that's where it dies and, off. So, so for this to move forward, it's that intermediate gap that needs to get filled. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We need more patterns. We need more teachers. And that's kind of my, that's my real driving force really. And I love designing and I love, I, so I, so I do love designing and I don't feel as much of a driving need to necessarily design all my own stuff. Mm -hmm. um, designing is hard. Um, a lot of my designs, I have to start over three or four times. So it's quite a process, but I will say it's satisfying in a way that nothing else really is. Um, you know, having that, like the bunny ball that I stitched where I wove bunny, little bunnies. It was like, I knew I wanted to somehow make a bunny ball. I love bunnies. I have to make a bunny ball. What am I going to do? And that was a long process. And it turns out like, and, and I will tell you what too, Gary, I am not a natural embroiderer. Oh, that, okay. Which is which is funny. Figurative embroidery intimidates the heck out of me. People who can who can, I can't even draw, you know, and people just make these beautiful flowers with neat stitches. And I'm like, wow, that is so hard. Right. But <laughs> but then you do, what then I you do level three Japanese Tamari and yeah, that scares those people. Right. So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, that's the fun thing is, is we all have things that I, I look at what someone else can do easily and I'm very intimidated and they look at what I do and I just go, well, I'm just connecting lines. That's all I'm doing. But so, so like my little bunny ball, I wanted to push myself and I, I wanted to embroider carrots and little carrot tops. And man, that was, that was a stressful two days making carrots. I'll tell you, I was just, <laughs> words were coming out of my mouth that, you know, listeners cannot hear. It was, mm. 
but you know, pushing myself. And yet now that it's done, I'm like so satisfied with it. And I'm like, Oh, Oh, that came from me. No one else was going to make this ball. So designing is not my driving force. I do enjoy it. It's not easy for me. Um, but, but teaching, uh, you know, teaching and spreading the craft. And that is just, that's my underlying goal. All day sure. long. Huh? <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I just, that is everything to me. Um, <laughs> now it's, it's tiring. It's hard work, but yeah. it's everything. Yeah. When I was uh, going through uh, your, your website and looking at your teaching, you have quite a list of options for taking classes from you. Is there one that is that you uh, like, is there a school like do you, the John Campbell school? Is that where you focus the that's most my or that's your place? Yeah. So. That's my favorite. So, I mean, I love John, John C. Campbell folk school and I fell in love with it when I went there for my first time. I've been there a number of times as a student and, um, and I'm thrilled to be able to teach Tamari there. Dana Watson also teaches Tamari there, who's another longtime student of Barb Cease. Um, Barbara Cease did retire a number of years ago from teaching there. Um, and so I was like, please, please, can I teach there too? <laughs> like, um, and I just have so much fun. And it's, I love to teach there because it's a week. You get a whole week of classes. Mm. It's, in, it's up in the Appalachian Mountains. They feed you really yummy food. And it's a whole folk school, so there are other classes going on at the same time. There's blacksmithing and woodworking and there's, you know, glass work and paper crafting and photography, all kinds of stuff. And they run all year. And you get this really non-competitive nurturing environment and you just – you're not in time pressure. You just – students can work at their own pace. And the way I like to teach is – I really like to teach individually. So if you study with me there, the first couple of days are kind of scripted because we've got to get through the basics. Right. But then it's like, where do you want to go? What, what balls excite you? What pattern excites you? And I can really tailor what every student is doing and so that they get what they want out of it. And that I love, I love, love, love. So that's my favorite place because, because I get, a whole week too. Now, do you have um, a, a do you have a regular schedule uh, at John C. Campbell? Or I'm usually I'm usually there in the summers. Okay. Yeah, like they they bring in a lot of teachers and a lot of a lot of different fiber crafts and stuff. So so it's hard to so needle craft shares the studio with the weaving. So I, I get in there like once a week, once a year primarily. Um, and I know I still have a couple spots coming up in Ju in June this year, but it's. I, that's my favorite place, but I do teach other places. Um, I'm, I teach at conferences sometimes like the mid Atlantic fiber arts conference coming up this year. I'm, I'm teaching beginner Tamari there, but when I teach there and I also teach a lot at private guilds and groups. So I will, I travel to private, you know, groups and I will teach eight to 10 people, you know, from the, the basics up and, I have a very specific way of teaching beginners, which differs from other Tamari instructors um, in that I actually, there's three steps to learning Tamari. You have to learn how to make the base. And that's kind of the boring part, honestly. It's not hard, but it's boring. But there's some important things about that. If you don't make the base great, then you're going to have a hard time later down the road stitching on it. And then the most stressful skill for students is usually learning how to put those guidelines on the ball where you're, you're marking and you're dividing it up into different segments. And the fun part is the stitching, putting, picking colors and putting your shapes on there and watching the pattern develop. And so I, when I teach beginners, I sit them down and I hand them a ball I've prepared and marked and we start stitching immediately. We learn how to do the basic stitches and how, how the, it's really like thread painting. I tell people because most of the thread is just laying on top of the ball. You just lay it where you want it. And when you want to take a turn, when you want to, like if you're making a square, you lay a straight edge. And when you're ready to make that corner, that's where you take a small stitch. And that small stitch is what anchors the thread into the ball and allows you to turn directions. So it really builds fairly quickly and it's very gratifying. And you're just learning how to, how to navigate the ball, how to move the ball in your hand, what your stitch should feel like. 
and and it's very fun. You say immediately you fall in love with it. You're like, this is great. Oh, I love this. I love this. I don't want to start someone by saying, let's wrap a ball in thread. That's boring. <laughs> like, like that's not the first thing you want to do, right. right? So we do that, and then and then the afternoon, and then we work on that, and everybody has fun. And then in the afternoon, I say, okay, well now we're going to do the stressful part. Here's one another ball that I've wrapped for you ahead of time, and we're going to put those guidelines on there, and we're going to learn how to do that. And we, we work through that together and okay, you know, that's good practice. And then we start stitching another pattern and we kind of learn other skills. And then the next two patterns. So I usually teach four patterns. Um, the next two, the student wraps the ball. I show them how to do the wrapping. So then they wrap and mark. And my whole goal here is that they are getting the fundamentals down. Like mm -hmm. by marking that ball, marking is where a lot of students have pitfalls um, so they've marked with me three times. It's really, it's honing that skill. Uh, it's really good practice so that when they go home, I, at that point, they're going to know how to stitch the patterns. I'm not worried about that. It's, can they wrap and mark a ball when they go home, yeah. you know, because that's setting them up for success. So, um, so I don't, I don't teach every weekend of the year because I spend a lot of time having to prepare all these balls for my students. <laughs> um, you know, that's, it's not the most fun. It's what I do in front of the television, but right. it's okay. It's worth it because I, I love the success that it produces and it's not the right way for everyone else to teach certainly, but it's the way I like to do it. Right. But my problem is when I teach private groups, everybody looks at Tamari and they think, Oh, can we do that in an afternoon? No, <laughs> like no. if, if no, I mean, if I came and gave them a, a pre-made ball, they could stitch it in an afternoon and they won't know how to make another one. So, right. Yeah. I, yeah. What I, have you gained I, there? Yes, exactly. I believe in like teaching the skill, not teaching a project. So I always insist when people say, Hey, will you come teach Tamari? I'm like, yeah, but I'm going to need two or three days, mm -hmm. two days, two days is my minimum. And it usually, I tell people it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. There's so much information and it's overwhelming for a lot of people. So three days is really great. You can slow down a little. You can absorb a little more slowly. But a lot, I find a lot of people, you know, you say, hey, I'm going to teach you how to make a little ball in three days. They're like, no, thanks. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's where, that's, that's where, my, you know, my teaching schedule, I, I am picky about where I go, making sure I get enough time. You know, but I do. So, so I teach, I do teach at conferences. Um, when I have a chance, I teach occasionally at Redstone Glen, um, in New York, Pennsylvania, which is, um, only a couple hours away from me. They're a, a, a weaving studio primarily, um, which is a lot of fun. The, the weaver in resident there, Tom Nisley is a very famous, uh, weaver and he's the one I learned how to weave from 20 years ago. So, uh, it's, it's fun to, to work with him and his daughter, Sarah Bixler. So I teach there sometimes, but mostly private. And I'll tell you that I, I believe I will be starting to teach through the Embroiderers Guild of America more. Oh, great. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I have never joined the Embroiderers Guild of America because I've always been intimidated by embroiderers. <laughs> and, and everyone tells, they, like people say, Jen, what are you talking about? And I know Tamari is, is embroidery. Right. But I consider myself a weaver and a spinner. And I look at embroidery and I think that's so, I mean, I do cross stitch too, but I'm like, oh, but embroiderers, that's hard. That's, that's real art. I can't do that. But I was recently at the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival. Um, I was there keeping a friend of mine company who was demonstrating bobbin lace. And I was just sitting next to her keeping her company. I pulled out a tamari and I'm stitching it. And I looked up and there was a table from the American hosted by the uh, Embroidery Guild of America. And I thought, oh, that's a sign. You know, like yeah. I've been meaning to reach out to them. Like I know I should get over this. Yeah, no, and we just did a show here uh, just a few weeks ago with Wendy Lynn, the uh, uh, head of marketing for EGA. Mm. And the whole purpose of that show it was to demonstrate to people that it's not just surface embroidery. Uh, you know, th that name is is deceiving. That it's all yes. forms of needle art, and uh, yeah, there's there's a home for everybody in that organization. It's um, it's so big and and so all encompassing that oh. uh, yeah, it's no it's, join. What are yeah. you waiting on? <laughs> right, and I'll tell you what, Carrie. I had it was so funny. This is such a funny story because I looked. I'm sitting there stitching a tamari, and I looked up, and they pulled out a bowl of tamari. 
and put it on the table. Mm. And I thought, oh my God. And, and then, you know, they had, I think three different volunteers and you could see people, you know, they're demonstrating. So people are coming and talking and I'm sitting here with my friend and I looked over and I said, I'm like, I need to go talk to them. And they're like, Jen, she said, Jen, what are you waiting for? And I'm like, well, you know, they're, they're. she said, you're a JTA certified teacher. Go over there right now. <laughs> and so I, okay. I went over there and they were, of course, were fantastically fabulous and welcoming. And they were just like, you have to join, you have to teach, you have to. So it was the kick I needed. And it was really, um, so if anybody is, yeah, I, I, I second it. If anybody's listening and they're thinking, oh, I, I, I don't know, I'm, in, I can't join. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I learned that lesson and I waited way too long. So yeah. I'm really glad to be joining them and excited to get to know people through the, that organization, not just the weaving side of fiber, but you know, the embroidery side, it is needle art, you yeah. know? Yeah. So, if you, if you do any form of needle art, they have something for you and they have it at oh. several levels and yeah, it's, uh, it's terrific. It really is. Yeah, and and I, yeah. think, I think they handle it well. That's why I, I mean, they, they sponsor uh, fiber talk and I appreciate mm -hmm. that. But even if they didn't uh, I would talk about them all the time because I, I really think they do it right uh, across yeah. the board and, and, and they're working to bring in young people and they just offer needlework at so many different levels and dimensions that you can find a home. You really can. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kicking myself. I, I would say if I have one regret from the past 10, 10 years of Tamari <laughs> is that I didn't join the EGA earlier. What the heck? Why was I so intimidated? Um, you know, but yeah, yeah. So I, I'm excited. I'm hoping to be able to, to teach through their organization as well. Um, Cause I'm, it's just, yeah. I'm sure they'll put you to work. I'm sure they will. Yeah. Yep. I hope so. I mean, I, I love, I love it. It's fun. And I, I am hoping, you know, my, my big secret, which I will let your listeners in on is that, um, I am hoping to start a YouTube channel this fall and start right. doing tutorials online because I recognize through the pandemic, like I really think the best way to learn is in person. I really do. And I hesitate to teach like virtually I've worked with students that have the basics down virtually, but I hesitate to teach virtually because it's like feedback is so important. Like yeah. there's, there's a lot of touching is, is your base too tight? Is your base too loose? Let me see what the problem is and show you. It's so the dimensionality of it fights us with like a webcam. It's really hard. Right. right. Um, yeah. But well, I, I think, I've, I think that, yeah. that uh, needlework teachers in general, I mean, uh, are starting to find those limitations. Uh, we didn't have a choice for almost three years. But yeah, you know, and it's but it's not perfect. It 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 opens it's doors. Not. It allows you to teach people you could never reach before. But then yeah, there are always going to be some limitations. And like you know, perfect example I can imagine with Tamari is your is your ball wrapped too loose or too tight, and that's yep. a, not allowing you to function properly. And yeah, you can't do that virtually. You know, it's exactly it's critical. And it's like that's why everyone thinks, well, I can wrap a ball on thread. How hard is it? And it's like, well, it actually isn't hard if you have a, these couple pointers down and you yeah. know what part of why I prepare a ball ahead of time is so that students can feel in their hand what it should be so that mm -hmm. when they go to make it, they have experienced what they're aiming for. Um, and as I show them how to wrap a ball, I show them the different steps along the process. This is what it feels like with just the core. Everyone squeeze it. Okay. This is what it feels like with the yarn wrap, which is like a batting wrap. Squeeze it. Okay. Now I'm starting to put the thread on and it's getting tighter. Feel it now. So that it's a really is a, a tactile learning. And I've always discounted teaching online because of missing that yeah. and not, and not being able to visually see where someone is going wrong. Like I, I really pride myself on being able to walk around the room a lot and see like, Oh, 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 you're, you're doing something. Let me catch you right now because students don't know if they're making a mistake necessarily and right. catching it early avoids frustration. But I've, but I've talked to enough people that are, that really enjoy the challenge of trying something new, um, trying to figure it out themselves. Um, and I need to validate that and that, yeah, reaching people that otherwise you couldn't reach, um, you know, I can't wrap balls and teach everyone that way, but maybe I could reach a lot more people if I put some stuff out there. Yeah, so. no, that's to me that uh, that almost overrides every shortcoming is the ability to people who can't travel, uh, young, young yes. people who don't have it, it for them to travel for a week long thing. No, I'd rather spend my vacation time with my family. Uh, yeah, but then you can. Yeah, vir virtual allows them to enjoy that. 
without giving up vacation time and, and you know and being selfish and say I'm doing this for me. The rest of you guys and the family can just tough it out for a week. Um, you know that it, it opens yeah. those doors and it opens doors globally that uh, many teachers just simply haven't had in the past because you know, a lot of people just international travel just not an option. So um, no. Yeah. It's not. It's not. Yeah. And and getting sponsorships to travel internationally. I mean, you know, yeah. it's hard enough to travel a couple states away at, for three days. And that just gets expensive for someone to host you. And, you know, how much can they afford? So it's it's true. It's true. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. so I'm I'm finally coming around <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and right. I so I'm I you know step one is maybe update my website with a little more like recent pictures and things and, you know, but yeah, YouTube is on my is is really. I mean, I I turned a book deal down a few some years ago because um, for various reasons I wanted to finish my JTA certification and I didn't, you know. So I I've had it on the back of my mind: Do I want to do a book? Do I want to do a book? Because I do teach things a little differently than Barb. I have a different perspective. I think I bring a lot of my um, my analytical sort of science brain to. Mm-hmm to understanding pattern and I like to categorize things. And um, so I have a different way of talking about it, which I do think is, has a place, Yes. but you know, book, book has always been like, Oh, if people say, when are you writing your book, when are you are writing your book? And, and that's kind of fallen honestly down my list of priorities to, you know, we don't really consume things necessarily with books anymore. It's more about uh, so many people just want to have YouTube videos and then maybe patterns, you know, just, I, oh, I just want a pattern. I, I don't need a whole book of patterns. I just want one pattern. Yeah. So, so that's kind of where I've been moving, moving my focus. I have a very busy summer of teaching, but once the summer is over my summer schedule of teaching, I'm feeling like, okay, time to figure out how to do YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, All right, Jen, yeah. we're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, Sounds I think, good. I think we could go another hour, but we better stop. So, um, the website is cleverbunnystudio.com. It's Jen Weber. Jen, thanks so much. Uh, learned a ton. Uh, Thank really you, Gary. All right. This has been my pleasure. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Mm-hmm.